Um, so, uh, te- teaching this retreat is, is a big stretch for me, um, just because of everything that's uh, going on with my health and what what that needs, what that requires. Um, <coughs> So I had a meeting with a nurse this morning, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, it, in a way that kind of impacts the the unfolding of the teaching. I have to be at the hospital at this time and all that stuff. So um, in a w- e- e- things are getting squashed together in one in one session, one long session that otherwise would, you know, I would otherwise if I had a choice I would pace them over over you know morning evening afternoon sort of thing so that's just part of the deal um, which uh, it's you know it's not perfect but it it is what it is and um, in my experience doing sitting lots of retreats is often when the conditions aren't perfect that's often for some weird reason when the retreat is most fruitful Um, so The other, th- the other thing about the teachings, and I said this again at the beginning, is that <coughs> everyone needs different things at different times. And so I feel quite sort of uh, concerned or anxious even just to make sure you all have what you need. But it's actually an impossible situation. So we're just unfolding things. And for some person, something that's said on day five, it would be like, well, wish I'd heard that on day one, you know. Etc. So, th- I don't quite know how else to do a group retreat. That's part of the territory here. It's part of the challenge here. So, um, hopefully, still, you know, it works and it's helpful. Um, <coughs> I want to try. Well, I, I want to divide the teaching today into three sections and maybe four depending on how we do for time so uh, two kinds of well an instructions a guided meditation and a shortish talk shorter talk so let's let's start with um, a bit of instructions actually so again a bit of a context just just like context so <coughs> I, I was going to say this later but I'll say it now um, Jhanas, by definition, you could say all the jhanas, but um, certainly we can say the first four jhanas. By definition, um, they include, or even I would say what's really primary in them, is that the the whole body, as I said when I ran through those descriptions of uh, the Buddha gave, the whole body really feels very, very nice and different kinds of nice, and in a way that's what characterizes each jhana, is the kind of nice that that, that the whole body space feels. So that, by definition, axiomatically, uh, a really pleasant feeling, nice, lovely energy body experience is is part of where we're going. In, in Actually, you could say any, any of the jhanas, or eight, in a way, because the absence of any sensation at all um, in the formless jhanas is actually very, in, in its, in its uh, kind of acquired taste kind of way, extremely pleasant. Um, but anyway, the first four jhanas all involve uh, a really nice energy body experience. So all the practices that we're doing are kind of going towards that. That's what they're kind of aiming for, uh, just by virtue. We're aiming for jhanas. As I said, which base practice or which springboard practice, whether it's working with the breath like this, whether it's working with the breath like that, whether it's metta, whether it's something else, whatever it is, um, they're all intended in that direction. That's what we're trying to get them to do. For, for, I don't know, most people, that the first sort of port of call in the niceness will be what we call PT and this pleasantness that I'll talk about as we go on. But basically what what you want at this point is to be narrowing down into one practice, one base or springboard practice. Um, 
that you feel is, is, is the one that feels best for you and the most reliable, easiest, that, that well-being uh, arises from that physical well-being, mental well-being. And we keep that practice all through, even after you've got eight jhanas, because even when you know eight jhanas, it's not, there's going to be times when you need to go right back to your base practice and, and, and use that. Yeah? So that's, that's, your, that's your thing for in terms of jhana practice. Later, we can add to it and have others. But basically, we're at this point, a lot of you, unless you're already well into the jhanas and know what works, like I said, and you already know it, and you just, that's my base practice, I know that's what works best. Basically, you're still trying to find that and narrow it down. Say, okay, that's the one for me. <coughs> um, now, within that, because, as I said, jhanas are kind of, by definition, different kinds of really lovely uh, states of the energy body, different flavors of really lovely states of the energy body, we can kind of again think backwards from where are we going? We're going to some kind of lovely state in the energy body. I can get there in, in kind of two ways. We're back to the whole Newton Abbott thing, kind of. Um, either I say, oh, if that's, if that's part of where I'm going, why don't I start with that anyway? And start with the energy body experience and just help it in creative, responsive, uh, sensitive ways to become nice, nicer and nicer. I'm starting with something that's very close to where I'm headed anyway, right? That's one way of going about things. Another way of going about things is, for instance, taking one spot, like at the upper lip or the tip of the nose or the abdomen, and just paying attention to the sensations there and, uh, and really, really paying attention. And in time, other factors develop, one of which uh, it, it sort of comes out of that is the PT, which can then be spread into the whole body. So not better, not worse, they're just different. One is starting with something much similar to where you're going. One is starting with something that, that actually doesn't look that much like where we're going at all. Okay, um, because at some point this, as I'll explain, will will expand to a whole energy body experience. Not better, not worse. Just different people. Different people find different things work work better. But that's uh, kind of what we're doing. Either <coughs> sort of the direct route or the kind of more indirect route. The more indirect route is more common. But why that is, I, I you know, just how it is. So everyone's different. And um, <coughs> why do I spend so m proportionately more time teaching about the energy body and all that? Um, it's probably partly because there are more possibilities there. There's, um, it's more unusual, so people need to hear. Most, most of you have probably spent a long time paying attention uh, to the breath at the nose or the upper lip or the abdomen or something. So the en energy body is more unusual. And there are more possibilities there. There's probably an infinite amount of possibilities in terms of how creative it becomes, how playful it becomes, how sort of um, imaginative it becomes. Um, and I find o over many years of teaching that for a lot of people who've had kind of very little sort of development or opening or joy from paying attention at one point, opening up to the whole body is often a revelation and things really start to move then. As I said, though, it's not the case with everyone at all. So we really want to find what works for you. This is so, so important. Okie dokie. So if we talk now, the first section of, of today's teaching, I want to talk about taking, uh, taking a narrower spot. Um, classic spots, rather than the whole body, the classic spots are, as I said, the upper lip, somewhere between the sort of top of the lip and the beginning of the nose, so that whole area there or uh, the sort of tip of the nose just inside the nostrils, anywhere around there, or that whole area. It really doesn't matter. The question is, when I pay attention to that sort of location, where can I most clearly feel the sensations of the breath as they come in and out? And there'll be sensations of the breath, you know, th the friction, really, of the breath moving across the skin or, or in the tiny hairs of the skin there. Um, or there'll be sensations of, uh, for example, the in-breath is slightly cooler because of the temperature than the out-breath. The body has warmed the out-breath. So temperature, sensation. This is, 
you must have heard this a million times. So, so that's one classic spot. Another classic spot is somewhere down in the abdomen. And what you're paying attention to then is uh, naturally, when we breathe in, there's the exp expansion, really the rising of the abdomen as you, as you inhale, and the um, falling, if you like, the falling back of the abdomen as you breathe out. And it's that sensation of the movement of the abdomen, those sensations that goes, goes with that double movement, rising and falling, and that's what you're paying attention to. And people feel it in different places, or it could be a slightly larger area, it doesn't matter. But what you're really paying attention to you know, is there's more gross physical sensations at first than what we're talking about with the energy body. But those are the two classic places. Instead of primarily having this wider space of the whole energy body, we've got a narrower space. It's a narrower spot. Okay. If I think of the word concentration and I automatically think of a narrow focus, this is just a prejudice and an indoctrination. It does not necessarily mean that at all. It cannot possibly mean that in Buddha Dharma. It cannot possibly mean that. So I'm fifth jhana, infinite space. I'm I'm concentrating, concentrating on infinite space. That's the exact opposite of a precise point. So it cannot mean that. It might be helpful to choose, as for some people at some time, to choose a small point, and then, as I said, then it goes through a whole process. But that's not what concentration can mean. It's not like concentrated laundry detergent, I've got this much in, or a concentrated sulfuric acid, or I've got this much in this amount of space. Y you understand? It's, com it's a complete uh, misconstrual. So maybe helpful to do it that way, maybe not helpful, but it does not what samadhi means at all. Um, so there's, there's a small focus, and it may be very helpful, but I would I'm going to say f uh, you've heard so much about w working with the breath this way. I just want to throw out three or four things. One is even though we have a, a small, a narrow spatial focus, I I would suggest it will be very helpful to have a background awareness of the whole body, okay? So if I say, and some of you are far away, can you see my hand? Can you focus on my hand, even if it's not that clear? Can you focus on it? Can you focus on my hand and still have a background awareness of the whole room behind me, what you, what's also in your visual field? Yeah. Can you switch those visual fields so the background is kind of, what's in the background is more in your foreground psychologically? Yeah, that's all I'm talking about. So, when when there's a small focus, it's really helpful to have the whole body sense just lightly in the background. Uh, not fifty-fifty, maybe ten percent or five percent or something like that. Yeah. So primarily, I'm really getting into this one spot wherever it is, but I'm always maintaining this whole body background awareness. Why? Partly was partly because. When I have a bigger space that way, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like a, t a, a, a table. If a table has one leg and it's a narrow leg, it's hard for it to balance. If a table has two legs, it's still it <laughs> if it's three or four and they're spread out, it's much easier. So something spread out helps to balance the uh, the concentration. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why sometimes the energy body works better. We'll, we'll revisit this in different ways. So it can stabilize ri really well. Does that make sense? Yes. Second reason is that what we want to become, and I'll talk more about this probably starting tomorrow, as we go on with all this, the factor of effort and balanced effort and right effort becomes more and more crucial, actually. It becomes more and more of a, a real investigation. And it's not the sort of investigation that we sort of nail it. Ah, day four, I got the effort thing right, and then I can forget about it. It will stay with you for the, for the rest of your practice life. It's just part of the art of practice. What, what's the effort level now? What's the subtle effort level? What's involved in that? Where, where am I with that? Is it a bit too much? The whole thing just develops and gets more and more subtle rather than something I've, I've done that now. So if we talk about developing the art of samadhi, we must include um, this kind of opening up the exploration and the subtlety of the exploration, the subtlety of the experimentation with effort levels. It, it just it, 
it's not going to be something you're ever going to get beyond. Okay, It's part of the art of it. And we'll return to this a lot. The thing about keeping the whole body in the background is that, thankfully, the whole body will... Uh, Awareness of the whole body will, will enable us to be aware when we're over-efforting. Because I mean, if I'm really over-efforting, I'm going to cramp up my muscles and I'm going to get a headache right between the eyes and that sort of thing. Um, it, even as, as the effort becomes a little more subtle, it will be reflected, maybe not in the musculature, but maybe just in the tone and the contraction of the energy body. But basically, as an instrument, as, as an instrument of sensitivity to effort levels, this whole body space is really, really useful. So it's going to tell me, oh, oh, I can feel just there's a bit of tension creeping into the energy body. It's telling me a bit too much pressure. Just relax a little bit. If I don't have that background awareness, I, I it's h much harder to be sensitive. You understand? So that's one thing. Um, then I would say let's talk about... <coughs> One, you know, again, w we can think of developing concentration, samadhi, whatever word we're going to use, jhana, as, as, okay, what it really is, is staring really hard and really unwaveringly at something. And if I can do that uh, with enough intensity and enough unwaveringness, I will get into jhana. It's just not true. Okay, uh, If I'm doing that and there is an openness of heart, it's not going to take me to jhana. I might get very good at staying with an object, and that's helpful. You know, that's helpful. It's not going to take me into jhana. Okay. So rather than think about it that way, we've talked about openness heart a little bit. We'll talk about it some more. But let me, let me emphasize three things rather than just hanging on to something. Three things you can think about. And in a way, you could sum this up as, as saying, let's emphasize quality of attention in any moment over quantity. In other words, quantity meaning how long have I stayed with the breath without losing, you know, going off in a thought or a sound or whatever it is. So very often what happens is we get into this quantity thing and one part of our mind is just kind of, is really you know, checking, have I had a thought yet? How long has it been? Have I been distracted yet? And counting breaths and etc. So it's not that that's unimportant again, but let's, can we kind of re-hierarchize our priorities? And I would say quality of attention is much more important. That means in this moment, with this part of this breath, What's the quality of my attention? And, and what's, what's meant in that? What's meant by quality? A lot of things. I'm only going to say, I'm going to point to three things today. Um, <coughs> intensity. Directionality. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but let's say that. Intensity, directionality, and uh, subtlety. So... <coughs> Let's do that in the reverse order. Um, as I said yesterday, again, we, we tend to think of jhanas and samadhi, and w we tend to think of them in certain ways. Um, and undeniably, I would say, it's the case that deepening in samadhi, and certainly deepening through the eight jhanas, is a movement of increasing subtlety. I cannot get away from that. Okay, Each jhana is more subtle than the last one. Each jhana is more refined than the last one. The whole deepening of samadhi, even before you reach jhana, needs to be a deepening into more and more subtlety. Okay, It's not the case, or you might sometimes hear it, that each jhana, the mind is more unwavering than the last one, as if that was the primary thing that's happening. It's not the case. You could have fifth jhana, you're not quite used to it yet, and you're wobbling out of it, and uh, second jhana that's much more stable for you, or whatever, or breath's much more stable, and you're just learning the second jhana, and it wobbles out. You know, so don't, uh, don't, again, it's like, let's get our sense of the conceptual framework. What's actually happening here? What's important? Wh therefore, what do I need to emphasize, work with, and pay attention to, and actually bother about? Yeah? So, subtlety is is a key element. Um, 
as you practice with the breath, whatever way of working with the breath or, or place you're paying attention, as as it g goes on and the mind settles down and, and the body settles down, the breath becomes more subtle. It should become more subtle. I mentioned this yesterday, I think. Also, if you're practicing metta or compassion, and sometimes compassion, you, know, you start practicing compassion, there's all these tears and it's you know, up and down and the world's suffering and it's great and we need to expand the heart that way and have it go through all that. But as it settles down, and deepens, actually the compassion gets more subtle. And the metta gets more subtle. There's less kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like certainly fiery emotions or intense emotions. The whole thing gets more subtle. Likewise the breath or whatever object. So there's this movement into subtlety. The object is actually perceived more and more subtly. As I said, we can get in the way of that either by having a certain idea or by doing something physically, like re repeatedly doing that, what was it called? Ouija, Ouija? Ujjaya. Ujjaya breathing or whatever it is. There's many ways we can block that process, in that natural process of subtleizing. So when the object becomes naturally more subtle, for the samadhi to develop, I mean already that means there's some samadhi developing, that's a natural, it, it cannot happen without that, but for the samadhi then to really keep developing, then the attention, the quality of the attention has to get correspondingly subtle, it has to, if, it's get, if, if my left hand here is, is going down to have subtle, the object, whatever is breath and, and metta, then my attention has to match it in subtlety, yeah? And, and that process, Subtlety, del so uh, th in a way, the attention needs to get more delicate there, and that that process of matching, of following the subtlety down, the attention quality matches the uh, object quality. That process is, you could say, one of the most central things that's happening, <coughs> one of the most central processes that's happening as samadhi develops. And as I said, the jhanas themselves are spec spectrum is, is, or the eight jhanas are a spectrum of increasing subtlety and increasing refinement. So, um, let me say these other two, what did I say? I said directionality. What do I mean by that? Um, I'm not sure if it's the right word, but something like this. So let's say you have <coughs> um, the breath uh, at, at, at the upper lip nose. Very easily, as human beings, we can, well, I'm not sure how universal this is, but it, it's very easy, one way, to construe the attention. In other words, to have a sense of the attention here, somewhere, oftentimes in the head, and it's going towards the object. So if the object is a visual object, certainly, or, or uh, it's going towards these sensations. Here's the attention, and it goes towards the sensations. And that's great. It's, pr it's probing them and, uh, you know, not attacking them, but, but going towards them uh, kind of in this more yeah, probing way, let's put it that way. But we can also, and I know many of you know this, we can also construe, and by construe I don't mean just an idea, I mean a, a sense, an actual sense, a perception of receiving the breath, which in a way of course the body is. The breath as air comes in and it's received. But the mind can also feel like the sensations are being received. So this is something we can play with. Uh, directionality, if you like, of attention. And this is something you can actually play with. The, all this boils down to what's helpful right now. It's not the case that one of these directions is always going to be for you better than another. The whole thing is a dance. The whole thing is like riding a bicycle. Um, oh, it's always good to lean to the left on a bicycle. No, it's good in certain situations to lean on to the left. In other situations, it's, it's good to lean the other way. Or, or right in the middle, or whatever it is. So all this, again, it, it, it's stuff for you to play with moment to moment, to have this sense of y you're the artist, you're the improviser, you're the person with your hands on, 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 the, on the clay, on the wheel. You understand? So subtlety, directionality. The other one is, uh, what did I say, intensity. So this is kind of a hard one, but I think it's really important. It's like... Can you get a sense, let's say pay attention to X, but can you get a sense of actually dialing up or down the intensity, the energy of your attention? What is it? So you might, again, you might think of it 
like that probing gets more. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it. But it might also be like, like just like a lamp going up or a sense of energy. You know, the di it's dialing up. There's more energy. There's more. I'm really present. I'm really alive there. Um, but this again, you think, oh, well, more is better. Not always. It's, it's an interesting thing. So if we, if we take all these factors together and you think about, okay, well, subtlety, what allows a subtle attention? Sometimes it's a delicacy of attention that allows to go into subtlety and not so much intensity. So if you think about maybe, maybe some, um, I know there are some fantastic chefs in the room, in fact, but le let's say someone's cooked this amazing meal, and it's ex exquisite, and, and, uh, and you're tasting it. And each mouthful kind of reveals, you know, sometimes when, when you put food into your mouth, the flavors reveal themselves kind of not all at the same time. Have you had that? Yeah. So, and sometimes some of them are mixed at the same time. What kind of mode of attention do you go into to, if it's really exquisite, and especially the chef's there and they want to know what you think. Um, so, it, there's a kind of delicate, a delicate poise in relation to the taste attention the gustatory attention. Do, do, so this is, this is delicacy. If I, I can't kind of go in there, you know, ramming in there, so right, wash up, and, and you understand? It, it's, it's not the right kind of attention that will reveal those kind of subtle, exquisite quality, if it's one of those really subtle dishes, you know. Or listening, when you listen for something, a sound that's, faint amid background noise. It, there's a quality there of, I, I w it's, you know, you're not squeezing something. You're not squinting. You're not pressuring uh, something. Um, it's more like there's a kind of poise and, and you, almost like you're, you're, w you're attentive in a way that your antennae pick up something. Yeah? So if you just, in a way, pay attention to how you pay attention in these kinds of situations, you might learn some we might learn something about about what i'm talking about here now what's also interesting is that when the breath becomes for example if the breath is the object or the meta is the object um the delicacy of the object as the object becomes more delicate and subtle it actually it can not always the case but it can uh become more delightful so the delightfulness of the object often goes with the delicacy but I would certainly say that uh, the, the delightfulness of the attention increases with the delicacy of the attention. So in other words, I think as human beings, we like paying attention in a delicate way. We actually like that. It feels good. Um, when that as that begins to happen more and more, part of, part of the job here is to enjoy that. Okay, it might be very, very not a big deal, but that's part of, can I get intimate also with this delight? Can I include it? Can I enjoy it? Which is, a very again, a very different thing. That am I still thinking? How long have I gone since my last distraction? So, So, okay, that's the first block of today's teachings. Um, a smaller point, and when you when you're using a smaller point like that, there's a few things to bear in mind. There's a few things you can play with. I mean, there's more, but that's that's okay for now. And I so said, where we're going is for this whole body s s space to be very pleasant in different ways. Um, but we can still use something that doesn't look that much like that. We use a small point, and for some people, that's what works best. As you get into this one small point, it will tend to grow. That's also one of the signs that it's getting deeper, is that it's almost like, well, well, this upper lip area kind of feels like it's about as big as my head now. That's, that's very normal, it's part of the, so it will grow anyway. In a way, that's part of the whole thing moving towards the, the whole energy body thing. So I'm just mentioning that. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about that piece. Um, why don't we pause there and do another one, yeah.